Moom coming in hot. Chinch, how we doing, brother? Dude, Moom, we've all been waiting for. Probably going to do something <laughs> on this show that I don't think has ever really been done, especially on a sports podcast for certain. Yeah. And we have one of the coolest dudes in the world who also just happened to be a great baseball player, but also does maybe even cooler stuff now. So yeah. take it no, away, does, dude. dude. I'll get out of your this way. This guy's one of the coolest guys. Good friend of mine, man. He goes back 15 years, played in the big leagues. Uh, was on was a big part of the 04 Red Sox team going into the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame one of the best Reds pitchers of all time um, and just one of the coolest cats ever has a has a brand new album out we'll talk about that in a second and I think he's probably as talented in his second career as he was in his first when he was a Cincinnati Reds Hall of Famer so let's bring it in our buddy Bronson Arroyo Bronson what's up man hello fellas <laughs> how you doing brother how's everything going I can play and sit in the, sit in the Queen City as you know <laughs> Where are you in the? Do you have a place there? Yeah, yeah. I'm just outside in Kentucky in, in Villa Hills. Yeah. Okay, nice, dude. It's not, people don't realize how nice you know that part of Kentucky and Cincinnati. It's it's a it's a great area. It's a great area to to uh, just be around. You know. Yeah, for sure. You know, playing here for nine years, it was like you know how it is. You get traded so often, or, or you you so so quickly through baseball. Sometimes you don't get an opportunity to have a place that really feels like home. But playing here yeah. for almost a decade, man, it's really yeah. It's, feel like you're entrenched in the community and people still support what you're doing out in, in the public. And, uh, yeah. you know, dude, we just missed each other too. You came and you know, it was funny how our careers came. You came up with the pirates and then you went to the Red Sox. I was, you know, with the Reds for those years, I left in 05 and then I believe you came in in 06, right? Uh, yeah, you, came in, you came in in 2006, you know, take us back to that a little bit. Cause you're going in the Cincinnati Reds hall of fame this summer, which is so awesome. Um, and, you know, take us back to your time in Cincinnati when you got traded there in 06. You know, what did you feel like? You know, where was your career going? And uh, did you did you did you feel like you were going to have the the time that you did in Cincinnati and end up being a Cincinnati Reds Hall of Famer? No, I was just I was you know I'm a creature of habit as all of us are. You know, you get to enjoy the city of Boston, man. You're shown at the Fenway Park and it's like packed every night, and you win a World Series there. I mean, I, I dreamt of playing in that uniform forever. And they honestly just pulled the carpet out from underneath me when they traded me to the Cincinnati Reds. And it was like, I mean, just a gut punch, man. It was, it was probably one of, you know, few times in my life that you just felt like, man, like, man, I got a raw deal here. And, uh, you know, coming to Cincy, I was kind of in a bad mood, to be honest with you. I got here and it was like, you know, just so used to, to, to the Red Sox being kind of like a front a frontline organization. We already had masseuses. We had good food out. We had <laughs> rock stars. You guys are rock stars. <laughs> you're going to Baltimore, man. You're coming down the lobby, having to get an escort to go to lunch because there's so many people in the lobby, right? And it's like, you know, and then you come to Cincinnati and it was just kind of, it was, I thought it was going to be quiet, you know, but luckily I got off to a good start. I hit those two homers to start the season in 06 and really could start feeling the fact that this city was so appreciative of having some starting pitching. And then, you know, the ball started rolling. I was an all-star in 06 and, and then the weight kind of lifted. It felt like, okay, I'm finding a home here. And then you start finding a way to make this place feel like Boston felt to me. And, and then over time, it felt like this city really honestly was uh, more my speed in a lot of ways. It was a smaller town. It wasn't so critical of me being out at night. They weren't, you know, just destroying you in the paper, man, you know, <laughs> so it was like, it was nice to play in a place that felt a little more relaxed. I could just go to the ballpark, play baseball, and people left you alone a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the city of Cincinnati, that, that's a baseball city, man. I mean, you know, ever since the Big Red Machine, they they love their baseball. And, you know, obviously you being in that city was uh, was, was pretty great. What, what Can you talk about a little bit about, you know, some of the guys you, you played with when you were there? You know, like Aaron Harang. You know, you and Harang were kind of the top tops of that rotation when you were there. You know, that and also you were pre you were pretty much around with a young Joey Votto. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, you know, you know, and, and what was that like, man, seeing him first come in and kind of seeing him evolve as a player? Yeah, I remember I remember the, first, the two things happened kind of in the first uh, early, early years there in Cincinnati. Got to Sarasota and I show up to the locker room when I just got traded, literally walk in the locker room. There's nobody left there except Aaron Harang, Kent Merker and Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in and first thing I hear from Kent Merker is, looks like the karaoke team just got a little better, boys. <laughs> and, uh, I had pitched against Aaron Harang, but I know I didn't know how special of a guy he was and how great of a pitcher he was, really. I just pitched against him in Fenway that the year before. And, uh, you know, it really was a nice match having him there because he really kind of like pulled the tide with me for those first couple of years. And, and also just, um, you know, guys like David Ross and, 
And uh, like you said, Joey Votto came in in 07. He was, that was his first year. Honestly, I, I, you know, he sat next to me in my locker. I tell the story sometimes. He asked me the very first thing Joey ever said to me was like, Bronson, can I ask you something? I said, what? He said, I think if I do more charity, I'll get to the big leagues. <laughs> <laughs> I said that in front of the team the other day in front of Joey, and I don't think he even remembers that he asked me that. But, uh, you know, that first time throwing him batting practice, I threw Joey. I used to always throw live BP, and you know how live BP is that you guys hate it, right? Because guys, Oh, yeah. Hate it. I would always go into live BP and tell the guys what is coming, and I would go down and away with fastballs the entire time. So I, I, there's no chance of me hitting you, and also you can just work on something. So, Joey, I'm feeding him just sinkers down and away, man. He's just shooting me to left center field gap all day, and I'm like, wow. Oh. Dude's got a swing, you know, like you could tell there was something there. I'd never seen him play, but you could tell he wasn't trying to pull me. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning of Joey kind of like turning into himself. Mm -hmm. like 2010. It was, a, it was a slow turn. You know, he was he was a bit uns unsure of himself. He was kind of a raw talent in a lot of ways. He had played he barely had played high school baseball. So Joey was a guy who you really got to see bloom at the big league level and turn into what he turned into. That's right, because he was Canadian. Absolutely. I, uh, a lot of hockey. He, he said he was never serious about baseball until he was like 16 years old, which is just, you know, unheard of for me. I was in the weight room as a six year old kid, you know, squatting, deadlift and benching, thinking about pitching in the big leagues. And Joey's right. just, you know, just picking it up for fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's incredible. I want to go there too, like as far as your journey starts. You have an incredible journey as far, as, especially as far as you like starting to work out early. Um, you know, get in the weight room with your dad and all the stuff. Uh, you know, as a young kid, can you take us take us back to the journey of Bronson Royo, like how you got started, how was baseball your thing, and also, like like I was talking about before, like you were saying, like you got into weightlifting pretty early in your life. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, you know, I didn't know what a strange childhood I had, but, you know, I was living in the Keys. I was living on Big Pine Key, which is just kind of a couple of the keys up from, from Key West. And my father was just into powerlifting. All of his friends were working construction during the day. And at night, these guys were benching 400 to 500 pounds, <laughs> 700 pounds on the same deadlift. And I'm watching these guys. They were all just monsters, you know. And, and um, as a four- and five-year-old kid, I'm in the weight room just watching. So when he asked me to play T-ball, and he realized really quickly that I could throw a ball across an infield like a 12-year-old, and we had never played a game of catch. Wow. His brain said, hey, let me put him in the weight room, and I, th I think I can get him a free education in college at least, right? So we just start upon this journey. And because my father already had a template down of lifting heavy, never missing a day, being dedicated to the craft, taking supplements, resting at night, carbo loading, all these wow. things that you do as a professional athlete, he was already doing in his own life. He kind of parlayed that onto me. And so, you know, I've got this DVD and I'm so glad I have this video, man, because no one would believe this stuff because I'm telling you, this. I looked it up the other day. You can't find a kid anywhere in the world who's pushed this weight in the world. Like <laughs> the records, all records, I was warming up with that weight to get ready for my heavy sets. And I weigh half the weight of these kids. So on this, on this tape in 85, it's, it's December of 85. It's over two days. I squat, bench and deadlift. And we used to do that twice a year max out twice a year and then you're working out playing baseball and then you max out six months later i'm i'm 60 pounds i'm eight years old i deadlift 235 I what squat, squat 255 and bench 130 like i just saw a kid in men's magazine who weighed 100 pounds who benched 87 pounds and they were saying like it was amazing i benched 130 and i weighed 60 pounds i was like a skinny <laughs> little kid Jesus. And, and you have the you have the video, bro. bro I, I gave it to ESPN one time. They showed it. We were pitching. I think when I was pitching against Wainwright in the Cardinals once. But but I, I, I was looking. I was just curious. And I was like, let me see if I can find somewhere in the world that somebody has pushed more weight than me as a kid. I can't find anyone in the same universe with what I was pushing. Wow. Wow. Bizarre, but that that led to me thinking about the game in a real strategic way. Because when you're a little kid and you're trying to push five more pounds and you're already deadlifting 230 and you're trying to get to 235, it takes you six months to do that. And how do you do that? You're talking about diet, you're talking about rest, you're talking about my father used to paint colors inside the weight room where you where your eyes would visually be looking. So if you're squatting and you were looking up, he would have the ceiling painted, these dark blood blood red colors or dark greens because he had read that in prisons to calm guys down they would put pastel colors so in his brain it was like let's turn the opposite so you know he was thinking about strategy and that is what also parlayed me into the type of pitcher that i was the ability to beat people with this mental chess match and not just use physical skill to get over the hump wow wow dude this is incredible that is absolutely how old were you when 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 you were putting up that weight that was eight i was eight that year that that's the that's the <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm eight years old. I hadn't quite turned nine. And, uh, and, and I've got all these. Unknown caller. Inside this, um, inside the old weight room at my parents' house, they sold the house, but I cut the sheetrock out because in the original weight room we had there, when I moved up near Tampa, we wrote all the records inside right on the, on the plywood. There was no, there was no sheetrock. But then when he drywalled the place years later to make the gym a little nicer, he had uh, covered up over all my records. So I cut a big hole out before he sold the house and I videotaped in there because there's stuff like, you know, I'm, by the time I was 16, I think I squatted 420, man. And I, <laughs> And I was weighing, I was still weighing like 125 pounds then. Wait, but when and you so, were eight, when you were eight, did you look like like Schwarzenegger? Were you like like shredded, like a like an adult? Tiny. I was just wiry and strong, and I wasn't doing anything that was extraordinary. Honestly, it was about being dedicated to the craft. Him showing me technique. Him talking about this in a way that was serious. You know, like my friends would come over to the weight room once in a blue moon, but it was like, hey guys, somebody can die in here. Like, sit down and be quiet. And you know, he just brought a seriousness to that, that most kids are not used to, but it also trained my mind to play mm. for a long period of time without being burned out because I was used to the grind. Yeah. T tell me, take me through that brother. Cause obviously, um, you know, the way you went about your craft, the way you do everything in life, if you know, Bronson Royal, the way you do everything in life, you know, you're so, you're so tough mentally, you know, you talk about the grind of, 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 you know, being a, being a starter in the big leagues, being an everyday player in the big leagues, the grind of 162. Um, you know, what were some of the lessons that, that you brought from, you know, that weight, that weight training with your dad that became staples of what, who you became as a pitcher? Yeah, a lot, a lot of it was the fact, like I said, just not being burned out mentally by being at the park every day for eight months and having hardly any time off. You know, there was times when I had conversations with guys like Johnny Cueto, we're taking pitchers batting practice at four o'clock and it's mid August and it's hot. And Johnny's telling me, I can't wait to go to the Dominican and have a beer on the beach, man. I just want the season to be over. And I'm like, Johnny, you got like six starts left, bro. You got to <laughs> go. You can go 16 and 10 now, or you can flip that completely and have a bad season just in the last six weeks here. And, you know, for me, it was just very easy to be at the ballpark every day on off days. I live inside the stadium, man. I just love being in the weight room by myself and nobody was around and, you know, eating some food and checking your email and just kind of feeling like it was home being in a big league ballpark. And all of that was due to the fact that I was so used to just playing the sport almost year round in my mind, even in high school, when I was playing high school basketball, I was competing on a high level, but we come home at night and you're still hitting the weight room. And sometimes you're still, you know, turning on car lights and getting your baseball done because we knew that that was going to be our bread and butter. And so, you know, that, that was the foundation that also I believe kept me physically healthy for 19 and a half years without getting hurt, you know, mm talk about yeah i was pitching not at max effort i was you know i was doing plenty of things out on the mound to keep myself from being hurt as well kind of like governing how how much you're put, stepping on the pedal but also this this foundation of just my tendons and ligaments being strong because they had been worked since i was a little kid and you know back in the 80s man you should have heard some of the conversations my father would have <laughs> he thought he was insane you know like you're gonna stun his growth he's gonna wind up being five six yeah. foot you know? <laughs> You hear all these crazy stories, but it didn't make sense to my father. You know, he was taking me to the chiropractor when I was six and seven. There wow. was time when I was in the Keys and I was getting a full body massage. He treated me like a professional athlete. And it was not because he was an athlete himself or he had a ton of money. It was just for him. It felt like he was putting fertilizer on this kid. And I think it's yeah. going to be something decent. And, you know, it wind up working out in a lot of ways even just being able to handle the minor leagues and grinding and not getting paid any money and knowing that, you know, there was a prize at the end of this thing and keeping your eye there and being dedicated to the craft for all those years. Yeah. Well, he's so, so ahead of the game. That's incredible how he kind of brought you on the journey. What's so funny is now, you know, people would look at, at 2023 and say, Hey, your dad's a genius. Like if your dad talked like that now, Oh yeah, he's ahead of the game. You know, what's his, what's his, oh. which, I hear stories about you too. And I know the same things happen to me where you try to bring a chiropractor or an acupuncturist into the stadium and they're trying to hide them in a, in a back room. Now you got an acupuncturist, you got a nap room, you got all this crazy yeah. stuff. I remember I, re I got chewed out twice in my career when I was a frontline major league starter for taking a nap before the game. <laughs> Are you serious? Now, now there's a nap room in every single major league stadium, but they yeah. used to look like Terry Francona called me in 2005 and said, I don't understand how you can sleep before you go out and pitch. I'm like, haven't you ever heard of like, you know, like the calm before the storm? Like, you know, I, I mean, like this, this, I've been doing this since I'm a little kid. And, and, and they were acting like I was bizarre when I wanted to go to the acupuncturist in the rookie league. They were like, oh, that's black magic, man. Yeah. It's incredible. It's amazing. I had a rolfer. I broke my back in 2006. I had a rolfer work on me, bro. 
no doubt the rolfer helped get me back but like I, I, they didn't want him anywhere near the clubhouse, anywhere near. They didn't want to even know I was working with him. I remember a doctor saying, he could break your back. I'm like, he just healed Like he just healed me. And like, you know, I, I don't know if he healed me, but I'm just saying he got my body back in alignment where I felt like, okay, now my body could really heal. But it is funny in the, in the uh, industry of the big leagues, man, they're very protective of any outsiders coming into that clubhouse. You know, I will say, I will say that's what I really loved about the diamondbacks. When I got over there for two years, Kenny Crenshaw is the head over there, man, and he don't care. If you got a machine case, he'd be like, you got something that makes you feel good? I don't know what it is. Bring it. Because I want to see it, and I want to test it out on people, and I'm going to test it out on myself. It was, it was That's so great. I remember Smoltzy had a guy named Chris Verna, a guy that I worked with, too. He was in Boca Raton. And, uh, you know, I know the Braves at times gave him a tough time of bringing Verna in. Verna's like, and Smoltz is like, this is the reason I'm so flexible. This is the reason why, you know, I, I move so well. This is the reason I do 30 starts a year. So I love looking back and uh, whatever the edge is, right? Whatever the edge is, Bronze, whatever's going to give me an edge, you know, over the competition, man, if it works, do it, you know? Bronze, now, now you're, you're the, the way you pitched and the way that you went about your business, man, like, 2023 could Bronson Arroyo pitch in the big leagues nowadays because everyone's like oh everyone's got to have velo 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 you know what would you what would you say to you know getting out there now in the big leagues for the next 10 years Bronze? well honestly I mean with 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 how hard guys are throwing and everybody seems to be you know 94 to 100 with with a slider that kind of goes down about 90 miles an hour honestly I think my game would play even easier now just because the fact is that nobody sees a big breaking ball very often anymore. You don't see guys throwing three pitches. Everybody's kind of a two pitch pitcher. They're going right. hard and you know, they're going, they're going balls to the wall every single pitch for five innings. And then they're out of the game. I still think my stuff plays at the big league level. When I was 40 years old and I was finding that I couldn't, you know, I was throwing 84, 85 guys were having a hard time staying back on it. Cause the league was starting to throw hard. Everybody's throwing hard. Um, I will say the one thing I probably would have more problems with these days is the strike zone. They have mm. tightened up the strike zone probably since, you know, in the last six or seven years. They are, they are not calling the ball off the plate like they used to. If you take Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and throw them in today's environment, they would still be great pitchers. But I'm telling you right now, they'd have a hard time putting up a 2-5 ERA just out of the mere fact that you're not getting that little inch off the outer corners and they're calling the higher strike zone. So it, it forces you to kind of think – in a little different way. And in 2017, I could see some of the older umpires would still give me a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. The younger guys were not biting at all. And a guy like Joey Vada will tell you, when he was a rookie, he would just, you know, he'd have to swing at balls two inches off the plate with two strikes. And now he could just spit on it all day because they are literally calling right on the plate. And that, that's one thing that would hurt me because I needed a little bit of gray area on the outside to kind of peck at it. Yeah, yeah. What about the pitch clock? Uh, you know, what, 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 what? How would you react to that? Would that affect the way you pitched it now? No, I was always a fast guy anyway. I really enjoyed kind of painting the game. As long as things were going good, it wouldn't have bothered me much at all. I think most of the guys I played with wouldn't have been affected by it. A guy like Homer Bailey, who used to come up to the front of the mound, catch the ball, walk all the way around and rub the ball up constantly, he would be bothered by it. And there's some <laughs> people this year that are going to be, you know, it's going to throw them out of their game plan for a bit. But if you get the pace of play, you know, and guys just stay in there, it, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Do you like the new rules, Bronze, with the with the shifts going away? What do you think of that? And I mean, obviously, the bigger bases that would I don't know how much that helps you, but you know, what do you think of the bigger bases, uh, the shift going away? Yeah, I you know I I like I think I like the shift going away a little bit. You know, yeah. just about guys like yourself. You know, I think it's I think it's a little more fair just to play the game a little more straight up. And to be honest, I. I I would be so agitated on the mound sometimes when, when if we had a shift on and I know we're playing to the numbers, but man, when they hit a nice ground ball right to the shortstop and I'm like, there's my double play. And I look back and there's nobody there. It was like, <laughs> it was taking the wind out of your sails so heavily that I almost felt like I I'm willing to roll the dice and not have that happen and let a few more base hits go between the, the first and the second baseman. But so I'm enjoying the shift going away. You know, the bases, I just think they are what they are. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's, you know, hurt or, or help anybody. I, I feel like it should, the game should go on as usual, but I will say only being able to pick off the first base two times is, uh, yeah. is a little, it's a little odd and there's a lot more strategy to think about, you know, you throw over one time and now it's like, I can either only throw over one more time. And this guy's going to get a giant lead and be able to walk into second base. So I don't know how that's going to play into the game. I'm very interested to watch that live on some of these real games and see what happens. Yeah. I'm interested too, man. I'm interested too. 
Before we get into your, obviously, what, what you're doing now, I want to go back to that 04 team in Boston because, you know, I think anyone that's on that 04 team, especially you being such a big part of it, being in the rotation, um, I think you guys are immortalized forever, you know, in, in, in Boston. I mean, I think forever that team, that 25 guys or 35 guys, whatever it took over the course of that year uh, to get it done, it's might be the greatest world series run ever, especially being down three Oh, can you take us back to your best memories of what, what do you remember about that Oh four team? And what are some of the stories that you still tell, tell to this day? Oh man, the, the, the couple of stories that I always tell, if people don't know anything about new England and I've had other big league players ask me, is it really that different? And at the time, you know, it was, and, and I believe it started when Pedro got there and, the, you know, in the late nineties and from then until, until long after I left, you know, as you know, being, being in that uniform as well, it was just it was like coming to see the Beatles reunite every night. <laughs> the two stories I can tell is one is we win the World Series and the cemeteries are full the next day of people reading newspaper articles to the tombstones, like literally reading them to their loved ones who had passed away and didn't get a chance to see the, a World Series in New England for 86 years. And and the other thing was I'd go out in the city and nobody would ever say, congratulations, you won the World Series. They'd always say, thank you. Thank you, man. Wow. My grandfather is still alive and he got to finally see one. And it felt like a weight of the world was lifted off this entire region in the Northeast. And, you know, playing in that locker room and having Pedro Martinez and guys like Derek Lowe and Johnny Damon and Curtis Lascanic, sometimes, you know, <laughs> a bunch of characters, man. Oh, I mean, the locker room was absolutely insane. I played in 20 <laughs> years worth of locker rooms and there's nothing that even comes close to Kevin Millar just whipping up a soup. Manny Ramirez, and David Ortiz, and yeah, he's talking to Tito Francona and Theo Epstein like they're his kids. <laughs> it's an absolute show, man. You look over and Pedro's got the smallest man in the world right in the locker room, cussing everybody out in Spanish. It was like, it was a circus every day. And then you'd go out on the field and you just knew that people feared that lineup we had. You know, you got Bill Miller winning the batting title in the seven hole in 03. It's like, you know, just, <laughs> just an absolute monster. I mean, I felt like the water boy on that team sometimes. And I was 27 years old and already had like two and a half years at the big league level. But, you know, guys like Kurt Schilling and Tim Wakefield, I mean, just pure professionals, man. These guys, you know, I had a great career. And still, the top four guys in that rotation ahead of me all have more wins than me. Two, you got 200. Derek Lowe's got 175. Wakefield at 200. Pedro's got over 200. Wow. Got Schilling with over 200. It's like I had 148 and pitch. I needed to pitch another 10 years to catch these guys. I mean, it really was an all star club and was so beautiful to be inside that arena every night, you know, just feeling like yeah. you were. That is so awesome, man. That is so awesome. I, and that, like I said, even as a fan, even at, I was still playing at the time, but watching that run when you guys down 3 nothing to the Yankees and you came back to win and then you obviously swept the Cardinals. But just going back to that whole <clears throat> that whole uh, rivalry against the Yankees was was super special. And I, and I love now, you know, you're, 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 the band that you're in is Bronson Arroyo in the 4 Does that have, is that have anything to do with the Red Sox? Yeah, it's totally to do with the Red Sox. So it's, it's, you know, we're trying to think of how to, how to really highlight the guys in the band, right? Because Tom Petty is Tom Petty, man. But Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers is a whole different thing, right? Right, right. The heartbreakers are what make Tom Petty who he is live on stage. And so yeah. these guys had brought so much to this album as far as the sound of the album and the three-part harmonies that we, I wanted to highlight these guys. So we're trying to think of names. We happen to be in Fenway Park. We're shooting some, some footage and some photos and stuff and rehearsing a couple of months ago. And they thought, what about the 04? Because we all met in 2004, right? Uh, because of Peter Gammons and Theo Epstein's charity events, we, we started hanging out and playing music together. We also, you know, it's four guys behind me in a band playing. And, uh, and we obviously went out World Series in 04. So it just felt very fitting. These guys are all from New England. Um, you know, they're big Red Sox fans their whole lives, obviously playing music out of Los Angeles now. But, uh, you know, that, that's the reason the, na the name is, is the 04. Oh man, that's so great. You know, I, I was telling my sons and I were talking the other night, we were going back to spring training. I, it must have, it must have been 2010 or 11 when, um, one of the coolest times of I've ever had after one of your, uh, you know, at workouts, you know, the day was over, you and I met up and, and you got your guitar and your ukulele and man, we played some Pearl Jam all night long. We had a couple beers and hung out on the back porch. And I was like, man, that was the first time I realized I had no idea you were such a good musician. I was like, that's not just Joe Blow playing like a guitar. Like Bronson has got an unbelievable voice. You know, the way you play guitar is incredible. And then we had the one night with Vetter in 2015 when Pearl Jam was in town. And I was like, I was like, Bronson, you got to come in for this dinner. Pete Rose came in 
It was what an unbelievable night. And uh, and then we, we got a chance to play that night. Could you take take us back really before we get going? Take us back to that night. Like, what do you remember about that night? And, and, and you know, what are, what are some of your best thoughts of, of, of that night in uh, Cincinnati? Oh, man, that was a great night. I was at the Green Dot Museum, which was like a mini Hall of Fame, man. Yeah. We had a dinner, right? We had good conversation. I mean, some of the highlights of that night were one is, one is I remember Pete Rose Jr. told a story where he told his, called his dad up and he said, Dad, I, he said, I, I'm, I'm 0 for 16. I need some help. I need some advice. And he said, I ain't never had no to call Larry Boa. <laughs> that's so great i ain't never been in a slump before call larry bell he'll tell you he'll give us some advice that was awesome and that was so awesome i remember you know pete's so witty obviously and so quick right man it was like it was the first time i had ever been in a room with eddie vetter where he was observing the man like (laughs) oh you know and it was like (laughs) out of pete's mouth eddie was over there just you know just inside just busting up man because you know Pete doesn't have a filter, right? And Eddie's kind of like, a, in a lot of ways, a, very, a guy who's very purposeful with his words. And so yeah. they're, they're kind of opposite ends. But, man, what a great night. I remember I remember we got the guitar out. He asked me to get the guitar out and yeah. uh, started playing a Pearl Jam song. And then next thing you know, it was 5.47 in the morning. And I, <laughs> you guys are still there. <laughs> it was, we were on the back deck. You're playing – Ed's singing lightly because he obviously has a concert in a couple of days. We're like, dude, we want to, we want to blow out this. But was, what was incredible, Chinch, is that Bronson knew knows every Pearl Jam song ever <laughs> made. So like, he would just keep going, and I'm like, Bronson, play another one. And Ed would just keep singing, and I, I, you know, I would sing along too, obviously. But it was like, what a cool night, dude. Like now, I look back and I look back at my life, and I go, one of the coolest nights I ever had was with Bronson and uh, and Ed on that back porch. I took, a, I took a blank vinyl record that night, a white, it was white, and I wrote the set list on it. I have the set list from that wow. night, and at the bottom it says, like, a guest appearance by Sean Casey. <laughs> <laughs> like the bad singer on the right. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> so great, man. What an unbelievable night. So, Bronx, your new album is called Some Might Say, and it is so good. It is so good. Just came out on Spotify recently. Obviously, I probably, we could, where, where, where can we find your new album, first off? You can get it anywhere, really. Uh, anywhere you stream stuff. If you're going to Apple Music, Deezer. If you're going to Spotify. If you're going to Pandora. It's on YouTube. You can you can find it wherever you stream your music. If you want to buy it on iTunes, you can do that as well. You can also go to just my my Instagram page. It's got a link right there. Uh, Bronson Rose sixty one. If you look at the link, it'll it'll take you right to where you can download all of it. Um, I think if you want to buy a live copy of it that's signed, if you go to Talkshop Live, they're still selling uh, some there. And I had I had some so- signed some copies that they're uh, selling there. That's the only place okay. to get a hard disk right now, I believe. I don't think they're on Amazon yet. Great, and you guys you guys just got together recently at at Innings Festival a couple of weeks ago in Arizona and played. How was that? What- was that one of your biggest audience to play in front, play in front of? No, you know, we're playing on like one of the smaller stages, you know, you got to kind of pay your due <laughs> pay your my music in a lot of ways. Right. It's like, you know, I am somebody in, in the baseball world, but musically, you know, I'm, I'm a new act. And so, you know, you play these festivals and I, I'm playing at two 30, three o'clock in the afternoon and Eddie Vedder's not playing until nine 30 PM. So, you know, but it's cool. Cause you get to see some of these other sh- acts play after you, you know, you kind of, but yeah, we played to a nice crowd, man. I'm looking out there at Dontre Willis and a bunch of guys were teaching baseball and we're playing to a nice crowd, man. And just to, you know, to, to play this stuff live is just telling your own stories is a little different, man. It's like, I never really thought of it being that special to write, to be honest with you. But I started this process a few years ago after I retired, trying to find ways to tell a story. And, and I started by writing uh, about subjects outside of me. A lot of people are writing, you know, about their own internal struggles in the world. But for me, I was like writing about the Vietnam War. I was writing about a feeling about riding down the street with a, with, with a girl that you have a crush on, you know, in a drop top car in 1975. And the weather's just perfect that night right and and uh i was trying to write about themes like that to see if it was a little easier and i started being able to finish songs and once i did that i i amassed about 24 songs that wow. wind up making 10 wind up, wind up making this record but uh you know it's just been fun to get on stage now and sing these stories to people and have people respond to it mm, i love it man what could you uh you know we talked about today could you play a couple songs for us off the album you know give us a little taste of uh you know you know, these are going to be in totally different keys. And, you know, the the, the album's a rock and roll album, and it's pretty yeah. good. There's a couple of quieter songs on there, as you know. But um, 
but I want to play them acoustically just a little bit. You can hear a little bit of the story. I'll play pieces of two of them. The first one is uh, the first one is a song that I wrote with Elliot Sloan from Blessed Union of Souls. I walked in his house that day and he was like, what do you want to write this about? And I said, um, I said, you know, Anthony Bourdain had just had just committed suicide. And right. It was it was in a very short amount of time. Robin Williams, Kate Spade, Chester mm-hmm. Bennett, Lincoln Park, Chris Cornell and um, and Anthony Bourdain had all hung themselves. And I was. Oh. I just thought, let's try and write a song. So this one's called Side Effects. Just kind of telling a story about a guy who feels like a good, feels like a good guy, but things are kind of going awry, right? Like I can't get away from whatever it is, heroin or whatever you got going on or this anxiety. And they're all taking, they were all taking pills, you know, to try to control that. And it didn't work. So <laughs> Right, right. Side Effects. Uh, it goes. I got a feeling, but I'm feeling alone. Don't know where I've been or where I'm going this time. Time. I'm not a loser, but I'm losing control. Nobody sees me at the end of this rope at this turn. Oh, I'm so burned. The painkillers, but there's no relief now. Quicksand is a bad dream, and I, it's a sign. It's the side effects that's the cost of your cure And it hides the rest of your loneliness How much can you endure? Jekyll and Hyde, I guess, is the side effects Oh, no, 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 no And then in the second verse, in the second so verse in the second verse, I'm, I'm saying like, uh, you know, hey, it's a good night. I'm actually feeling good tonight. Maybe I don't need that stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any anxiety. I don't have any depression tonight. I'm having a good time. But then as the night wears on, you start, you know, kind of feeling it coming. So the second verse starts like a uh, uh, red carpet in my makeup zone. My star shining on the boulevard on this night. Yeah, I'm all right. Feed the viper, the adrenaline rush I can't contain it cause it's in my blood, my mind's eye Yes, he's crossfire I resist in futility, no And quicksand is a bad dream and I It's the side effects, it's the side effects That's the cost of your cure and it hides the rest of your loneliness How much can you endure? Jekyll and Hyde, I guess, is the side effects Oh, no, 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 no It's the side effects, it's the side effects Oh, no, 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 no <laughs> Bro, that's so good! That is so good! It's side effects, and you know, I wrote these songs like uh, some of them were written over riffs from the guys in the band. Some were written like that, just nice and easy. Um, you know, but I was trying to find a way to see if I could just finish songs. It was very difficult uh, to, I, I would write songs about kids all day because it's very direct. You're saying like, eat your fruits and vegetables and get your sleep at night. <laughs> but to write a song like you're hearing on a Pearl Jam record, that's a little cryptic. You can kind of grab parts of it and use in your own life. And you're not sure what he's talking about, but you think, you know, you know, trying to write in that way is a little different. And that, that took me a while to try to kind of relinquish the control of putting the words down and not feeling like they were too, too cliche or that mm. someone them apart, you know? It's funny too. I, I love how you said like, you kind of got out of yourself to write some of the lyrics. Cause you know, you hear those songs, you'd think like you, you, you almost think every, every guy that, that writes, you know, the great, uh, the, the great writers out there are writing about something that's internal or something that they've experienced. I think it's incredible that you've taken other people's experiences and, and made, you know, really made that most of your album. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to, you know, you're just trying to find a way to connect, you know, with people. And, and for me, I've just been such an optimistic guy. Part of it was that being right. in the room with my father all those years and him, you know, him being like, it don't matter if you don't get, you don't squat 230 today, we're going to get it tomorrow. Right. It's like you went over four today. Who cares? You know, that optimism made me where it's very difficult to write songs that feel like they're coming from a dark place, but that's the stuff I enjoyed listening to my whole life. And so I was trying to write about some harsher subjects that wouldn't necessarily be about me, but that you could find a way to infuse a pinch of yourself. Every one of these songs has a bit of Bronson Arroyo in them and kind of the thread 
that goes through the record is this optimism about living present tense because we all will die very quickly. Right. So I'm like writing about this harsh stuff, but there's little pieces in there, you know, um, in the, in the song called nights alive is my favorite bridge on the whole thing. Mm. And, and the bridge of the song, it goes, it goes, uh, it says like, uh, what a beautiful night to share with you. And we can do what we want without any rules. I so remember these times because they won't last forever, not forever. And it's just this beautiful song about riding around in this car with a girl. And, uh, you know, that bridge just really encompasses what I what I'm about. It's like you better live for the moment, man, because it's going to pass quickly. And um, that's what you hear. Who that is me in this record. But uh, so I'll play you one last piece of a song. Uh, this one's probably the prettiest song in there called Never Let You Go. It's like a little acoustic ditty that I didn't know what I was going to do with. I found this chorus, man, that just said love is all you need. And it's I'm giving an homage to not only John Lennon for writing All You Need Is Love, but I'm also giving an homage to Love Boat Captain, where Vetter says, mm, yes, love is all you need. And I know it's been said before by John Lennon. And I'm saying I know it's been said before by Vetter and John Lennon. But I'm telling you again, like, you better get some of it in your life because it's the only thing you're passing <laughs> on to, right? So, so great. That goes. The two stars are born just around the bend. One became the walrus and Sergeant Pepper's band And they could both write a song With a little help from their friends And as far as yesterday you know it's gone Imagine if it didn't end Now we're blowing in the wind Like a rolling stone they say my voice is trash, yeah, but it moves your soul and they're still sending boys and girls to war. Oh, I can't leave them alone. As I sit up in this tower watching kids knock, knocking on heaven's door. So hold me close. Don't ever let me go Make it through this storm And love is all we need It's been said before I'll never let you go I'll never let you go pretty little ditty oh bro that's so good man that is so good yeah i need like, that a is so good daiquiri or something sitting by a pool right now <laughs> it's so good so man. Awesome, man no it's it's been really nice it's been really nice i mean the, the album is growing on me the more that i listen to it honestly you know you record something and your ears get tired of hearing it and you know yeah. but performing it live and you're realizing you're, you, the sounds on the record sound just like it playing live you know and some things that you almost thought were invented by the studio but you actually realize oh it's the three guys singing behind me that are making that yeah sound. yeah talk you know, about that the three-part harmonies that you're like hey this has got to be part of my band why was that so important for you yeah i just you know i'd watched a lot of music over the years listen a lot of music seen a lot of live shows and one you, you see in modern times a lot of people running tracks which is there's backup vocals there's extra music being played at live shows people don't even know they go to a nickelback show or you go sometimes to a different rock show and there's there's things that are being played you know on recording that the drummer has a click track in his ear and he makes sure that you're on time and then everything plays at the same time and i just wanted to pull this stuff off without doing that and so part of that was to be like hey i i'm not going to sing any harmonies I want you guys to sing these harmonies and write these harmonies. And I want to be able to do kind of a throwback to the Eagles of the 1970s and be able to just do that singer songwriter thing, even though the songs are kind of ripping, I want them to be able to do that. And, and I'm so glad that I asked Clint Walsh to do that. And he wrote a lot of these backup vocals because it's made playing live so much more beautiful than just hearing myself sing. It feels like you're supported by a cast of guys that are not only playing the music, but are there with you having to work hard to sing these harmonies and get them right. Is it a lot like being in a clubhouse, being part of a team? Is like, is it, you know, it's not as many guys, but do you feel that same, you know, energy towards the guys that you did in baseball? 
Oh, absolutely. It's like, it's a, it's a brotherhood, man. It's like you're traveling together, you know, you're eating together. You're, you're, you're getting nervous before the show and you see guys falling into their, their usual habits. Like, you know, you used to see guys stand in front of the locker, maybe they're taping their wrist and they're doing, yeah. they got the shot of coffee and you're, you're starting to listen to your music, whatever it is. Well, these guys are, they're putting their, their instruments in their hand. They're starting to hit, 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 hit something with their, with their sticks and they're stretching and you can see the anxiety building up and we're about to do this thing. We're about to, this is a, we're about to go to war and you're, you're having to suppress your adrenaline you know and like all these same things that are going on in the baseball locker room are happening yeah. pre-music yeah. show sure. oh, dude that is so great you know putting it all together bronze it's funny when i think about your passion for where you're going in, in in the music industry and your passion for baseball for all those years too um you a few years back playing with vetter at fenway park so you're at back at fenway you're playing black with vetter on stage with Pearl Jam, what was that like, man? And, uh, that's <laughs> that is one of the greatest moments. You know, you know, there's a lot of times when when we, we think you say you say you can, you know, you can do you can tell kids you can do anything you want in life, right? But there's sometimes that you manifest something or that you think about something that you hope will happen and will fall into a certain place. And it doesn't it doesn't always check out. But in this instance, you know, I had I had been thinking about playing that song with Eddie for for many years, playing the guitar. I'm just I don't know where this is going to happen. I don't know if it's going to be on a back porch like I was hanging out with you or if it's at the Green Diamond Museum or on a stage with Pearl Jam. And Eddie's given me the opportunity several times to jump up on the stage with him. And that night in Fenway, man, playing with the whole band and being able to just, you know, sing the backup vocals without him saying it to me. Like we didn't have that conversation before the set. And he looked over at me and I was like, I think he wants me to sing the backup vocals. And like <laughs> in front of 40,000 people, you start singing the backup vocals and, and then him just being so dialed in to, to get 40,000 people to turn their phones on, stretch the song to eight minutes. I'm watching the moon literally just bounce off a tarp on the mound <laughs> And, and thinking, man, I can see this beautiful field where I won a World Series. I'm playing my favorite song of all time with my favorite band of all time. And uh, it just it just would never get <laughs> I mean, if you told me, Bronson, hey, here's your World Series ring. You can have that moment and give up your ring. I would give right. up the ring. Now, I wouldn't wow. give up the experience of winning a World Series. That was my right. life's work. But the actual just piece of jewelry, you can have that. I'll take the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so great, dude. Dude, I remember... I think we talked the next day, uh, you know, after you'd done that. And I remember just being so happy for you. I'm like, if there's one dude in the world to sing up there with Pearl Jam and Ed and, and be ready for the moment, bro. But you were ready for the moment. The fact that you had, the fact that you were such a good musician, you were able to get up there at Fenway Park and play, man. What a cool, cool story, man. Forever. You know what was great about that night too is I had played one other time before that with him where it was just me and him on the stage and I had I couldn't really listen to his vocal while I was playing because I was trying to focus to make sure I didn't mess up the guitar parts because there was no net below me I, I didn't have right. band time. when I got to play with the whole band I knew the band was going to sound amazing no matter what it didn't matter what I did so I really got to take it in I was listening to his vocal singing along with him had a little jam session off to the side with me Ed and Stone Gossard for about a minute and a half I'm a creepy <laughs> other side just absolutely destroying it like you know i'm taking in these moments as it's happening which is very difficult to do on that high of a level sometimes yeah. you know yeah wow man absolutely incredible so yeah man bronze we can't thank you enough for coming on and 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 this has been incredible this is the first time we've ever had uh, a real live musician play for us yeah. on the, in the mayor's office so chinch and i are fired up about that we know our listeners will be too uh bronson arroyo in the 04 some might say is the new album go get it go listen to it on spotify it's incredible i just listened to it the other day it's so good um and chinch do we want to do the last thing with bronson with with the um yeah we with do that the, super uh, quick before we go yeah really really quick bronson we we had this whole thing this week about who was going to be our guest on monday and we we were doing funny answers and and yeah. uh this is how so interesting so we're so look we did a silhouette I don't know if you can see that. That's actually you. That's actually people you. Were, people were saying Randy Johnson. You know, yeah. people we we were saying funny answers only. People yeah, said it's either Juan Marichal or it's Bronson Arroyo. <laughs> there you go. All right, so I'll rip through a couple of these, and we got to pick a winner. Who's going to get a Casey T-shirt? Yeah. You're going to get a signed ball. We'll do this really quick. All right. The Hustle In wrote David Lee Roth, which is a fun one. Okay. We got Rocket holding flowers. Somebody said <laughs> Brian Boitano said L A N Y. 
This one, I, this, this one I kind of like. Glenn Myers, Marge Shots Pool Boy. I don't know where we go. With that. Uh, that could be true. <laughs> Kay Brian White said, Bronson Pinchow, Don't Be Ridiculous. That's a perfect Strangers reference if you remember that show. Uh, right. Let's see. Carlos Pena, former baseball player, chimed in. That's Charles Bronson from his never released karate movie. <laughs> it's you, not Carlos. bad, Carlos. Laos My Dog wrote The Love Child of Fabio and Raquette. Uh, one more. Uh, Nuke Lelouch, A Cat Bathing Itself. And then Mitch Kramer from Dazed and Confused. Are there any of those? Oh, this one, one guy wrote, I was typing my answer, but A Rod knocked it, my phone out of my hands. <laughs> so, I think that might be the winner. What do you guys think? That's a good listener, bro. Those are some really good answers. <laughs> what do you think, guys? What do you, what do you think? Um, uh, I like that. La I, the last one was good. The, uh, there was one. There was one other good one too that I should have uh, wrote down. Let's see. Uh, the Bronson Pinchot one. We got. Uh, Pena's is good, but we don't need to have him get assigned. Yeah. Case what, what about what, what about what's the what's the Rockets one? The Rockets one. It was a. Hold on. Where'd that one go? Rocket. Right? Uh, a rocket and a, and a something. Oh, did I say Darth Darth Vader holding baby Yoda? That's another one. Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, we got a lot of Steven Seagal's and Chuck Norris's, but uh, wait, which one? Oh, Kenny Powers. Right, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go with, I'm gonna go with that last one with that the guy, that, the guy that said, yeah. All right, that's Matt Gill. Matt Gill wins a baseball. Bronson, dude, thank you so much for doing this. I am tripping out right now. I cannot <laughs> wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear it back, man. Time to do a, a, a pod. You know, usually you're doing a podcast with a stranger, man. It's so nice to do it with you, Case. And, uh, <laughs> You actually know somebody you can dig in a little bit it's nice Ah, uh, dude it's great bronze you're the best dude and uh I'm, I'm fired up dude i can't wait to catch a show at some point man with you guys and uh good luck the rest of the way we'll put chinch we'll put the links all the Everything. links that bronson yep. said we got all that set for all our listeners out there and uh good luck to you man this sunday march 19th we're down in tampa playing the others innings festival with dave matthews third eye oh, blind fuck. and weezer so that one's going oh. off uh, Tampa Stadium, March 19th. We'll be hitting one of those early stages as well, about 2.45 in the afternoon if people are listening. Okay, there you go. Tampa at Innings Festival. That's incredible. All right, Bronx, man. Good luck the rest of the way, bro. And nothing great than seeing better than seeing you starting a new career after your, you know, after your big league career. So you're the best, dude. Thanks a ton, man. I'll, I'll talk to you soon, brother. All right, guys. Thank you.